A few days ago, uh, one of the people help, that helps me with Facebook, my Facebook site, posted something I had sent to her that in 24 hours had over a thousand likes and so I thought I'd share it with you. Some of you probably may follow it, but um, this was a story about two twins, a, a pair of twins, and one, uh, they were in different incubators. One was dying, expected to die, and the other was fine. And a nurse uh, fought against the hospital regulations and had them put in the same incubator. And once they got into the same incubator, the healthier one put her arm around the less healthy one uh, in, in an embrace. And the one that was supposedly dying, her temperature came up, her heartbeat stabilized, and she made it. So um, the picture comes with it. And it was really something to reflect on for me. I was mostly interested on the level of the response to the story. You know, what is it in us that responds pretty universally to that as a sense of uh, goodness? And my, my experience as I, as I reflect on it is that it really takes us out of our, uh, the small-mindedness of our doings and reminds us of what matters. That the real healing and the real joy in life is it comes from connectedness. It comes from embracing each other, embracing ourselves, embracing life. And we can't embrace life if we're on our way somewhere else. Right? There's that wonderful um, teaching that to be kind we have to stray regularly from our path that path that we're rolling forward into the future to get the next thing done, right? So tonight's class is really part two uh, and a two-part uh, series on uh, arousing happiness. And I'm basing it on a line from the poet Hafez who says, uh, whereas you, my dear, still think you have a thousand serious moves. You know, he describes his chess game, then saints, they're playing with God and they just surrender joyfully. Whereas we think we have a thousand serious moves yet left ahead. And how that map that we live in, and you can just ask yourself, is this true? Do I have most moments of the day, do I have a map in my mind of I'm here now and I'm on my way to such and such and these are the things I have to do? Does that resonate for many of you? Yeah, for those that aren't here and are listening, there are nodding heads. <laughs> so, we're not so much in the happiness business, in the sense of expressing happiness. I came in tonight and one friend here, I asked her, how you doing? She goes, oh, I'm happy. And, and everything in me went, yay, you know, you said it, you said it out loud, but it doesn't happen that much. There's a, a cartoon of two monks who are meditating side by side and one looks really annoyed and he's saying to the other, will you stop yelling out ka-ching every time you reach oneness with the universe? You know? <laughs> well, I actually was thinking, well, what if here we were meditating and we agreed whenever you feel really connected or happy or alive, just yell out ka-ching, you know? <laughs> it would be kind of funny, it would be popping around the room, you know? But we don't uh, notice the moments of happiness so much and we don't express them, we don't savor them. And uh, in a way, we're wired to experience love and wonder and happiness. We're wired for it. And as we've talked about, and we talked about this last week, we have a bias towards the negative. It's part of our survival brain. So we tend to fixate on the bad news, most of us. We do. So to name it that we need all of our emotions. We need the ones that are called negative emotions. They're, they're part of what allows us to sense when there's a threat and they move us to respond in ways that help us to make it. And on the spiritual path, 
remember that phrase, you know, no mud, no lotus, right? It, they, they're part of transformation. They open up our hearts. So we need them. And because we have such conditioning to fixate on what's wrong, we also need very intentionally to pay attention in a way that wakes up our hearts to happiness. So in a way there are two domains of spiritual practice and one is be with what's, what is, like fully bring your presence to what is and the other is to make sure that you also include what your mind's not fixated on but what might serve your freedom. Does that make sense? Okay, I'm, I'm glad to. <laughs> Thank you. The point of the talks on A Thousand Serious Moves is that we're biased towards fixating on painful emotions, on depression, on unhappiness, on judgment, on anger. And so the training is to learn to be with those experiences, wake up out of the stories and be with them, but also to cultivate what's there but often we don't pay attention to, which is our capacity for happiness, for loving kindness, for joy, for wonder. So it's both. It's both be with what is and cultivate the positive. We're good? Okay. <laughs> A linguistics professor was lecturing his class one day and he said, in English, two negatives make a positive. He said, but in some languages, for instance, Russian, two negatives still remain a negative. However, he said, there's no language wherein two positives make a negative. At which point a voice in the back of the room went, yeah, right. <laughs> okay, so the underlying principle of tonight's uh, of tonight's exploration and we'll be reflecting together um, practicing the strategies that wake up these positive emotions. The underlying principle is this, that where attention goes, energy flows. What you pay attention to, that's where the energy goes. So what that means, the Buddha said it this way, he said, whatever the practitioner regularly thinks and ponders upon, that will be the inclination of the mind. Neuroscientists say neurons that fire together wire together. Now, this is a really key understanding in our lives because if we really got it, if we really got that how we're paying attention, what we're paying attention to is affecting our mood and affecting our inclinations for the future, wouldn't we maybe make some more choices of how we're paying attention? Like if we could remember that? I'm lucky because if I'm giving a talk on something, I have to kind of use that as a filter for things that are going on. So I've had a really kind of a pretty fun week, you know. I, I came in tonight and I left a little late and then the rains came and I watched my mind do what it does because I, I have anxiety about being late for class. So I watched, starting to worry and starting to predict ahead of time where the traffic would, you know, really clog up and so on. And I said, okay, where the attention goes, energy flows, where attention goes, energy... I started, you know, reminding myself of that and I said, okay, so I don't want to deny that there's anxiety. So I felt, felt what was there. But also, the rain was coming down, I have a convertible, so I could really hear it playing on the roof and I love the sound of rain. So I said, okay, I'll pay attention to the anxiety, but I'll also uh, let that wash through. And it was really something that having, just enlarging my attention so that it wasn't fixed on worry thoughts, which of course create a certain biochemistry which create more worry thoughts. It's not a fun looping to be in. The rain, just listening to those sounds, shifting my attention, not away from, but opening it, allowed energy to flow in a much more uh, alive and freeing way. 
So it becomes interesting to start noticing what do we spend our time thinking about. And that's not a, a, an invitation to get down on yourself. Because we know that, you know, when we're honest, we're pretty self-centered. A lot of our thoughts are about how am I doing, what do I need to do more of, what's going to make me feel better about life, how are, what am I going to do to have others feel better about me, 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 you know. So, okay, so we see that. And it creates more eyeing and mying. This is selfing. If we can see that and know that it actually doesn't create happiness, we can begin to make other choices. The challenge is the patterning to get fixated on the negatives very strong. And I think it's something to respect. Um, it starts in infancy. That, and again, it's the culture, it's our families, it's our genetics, but we in some way experience very early on what I call severed belonging, where who we are and what we are is not met in a resonant way, that there's not the attunement that we're really longing for. So something happens, either a parent loses their temper and yells or pushes us away or ignores or doesn't respond to our cries, or maybe goes away unexpectedly. But there's some, some kinds of severing and their survival brain then fixates on it and looks through life at experiences that are similar when somebody looks or acts or speaks in a similar way that might mean I'm endangered, I'm going to be rejected, I'm going to be shamed. We filter for it. The painful experiences are the ones that the brain codes. It leaves traces on the brain more readily than the positive. So we move through life and we have, you know, I described the spacesuit self that we develop to in some way protect ourselves from the pain, the raw pain of those imprints. And this, this negative bias is, is pretty strong and it's, those are the neuropathways that, are, that the mind runs through again and again. The thoughts of somebody's going to reject me, I need to do this, I'm falling short, the feelings that go with it. So what happens is that we develop strategies to not feel bad. We try to numb and not feel that. And then when we start meditating, so you, just, you hear that meditation reduces stress, you hear that meditation brings a more happy, centered life. So you come to class and you start getting quiet and what comes up? <laughs> that stuff you've been running away from, right? <laughs> so initially it can be really difficult. You start realizing, oh, I'm obsessively thinking about stuff that's really causing my biochemistry to have aversion. You start realizing that. Oh, so that's where my tension's going. That's where my energy's flowing, you know? We start recognizing it. And then we start sensing underneath that obsessing, wow, there's some real deep sense of being flawed. I'm saying this because initially meditation actually gets us in touch with the, the patterning and underneath that the raw pain that we've been running from. So then a teacher will say, well, the way through is through, right? Just be with it. And so we start being with it and f funny thing, but we f realize that we're not meditating as much and we realize, oh, we stopped coming to class and it's two years and we went, wow, I really got away from that. Well, what happened? What happened was that it was really unpleasant to meditate. It was unpleasant because there were layers of unlived life we were getting in touch with and, and we didn't want to do that. So we had all these reasons for not meditating. So then we start hearing these teachings about a thousand serious moves that maybe we're going at it too grimly, which is the whole reason I'm going into this riff right now. You will not keep meditating if it's really unpleasant. There needs, it's as Thich Nhat Hanh said, it's not enough to suffer. <laughs> you have to touch peace too. That's why we have this balancing. Yes, we have to have the courage and bravery to be with what's here. And we need to touch into the bigger picture, into the streams of happiness and love and peace in order to have a space that can hold and be resilient with what's here. 
It's as if the mind is this garden and we're learning to be with it and we be with the wildness that's there and we be with, you know, all the thorns in the garden but we also do some weeding and we also plant some seeds of beautiful flowers. So that's all background for me to move further into how do we plant those seeds that allow us more fully to be with the whole of life, not just what's so difficult. But before I go into it, when I start teaching about um, cultivating really positive states of mind, of really being happy, there's a fear that comes up from some people. And the fear is, you know, if I got happy, I might get complacent. I might stop working on myself, I might stop caring about the world and trying to serve the world, I'd just get complacent. What about the suffering in the world? I mean, should I really be spending time meditating and arousing happiness, you know, when other people are having a hard time? And I hear this a lot. So, in a way, just to say that there's really a difference between the kind of self-centeredness that's out grasping after pleasure, wants to possess more, wants to experience more, me, 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 I want, I want, and the quality of heart and presence that arise when we cultivate these positive states. What I've seen is those beings that are really serving uh, true transformation, radical transformation on the planet. I think of the Dalai Lama and his infectious giggle, like he loves to giggle. He's got like this bubble of happiness in him and yet he cares deeply about the world. You know, I think of Thich Nhat Hanh who teaches about eating a peach. So a friend of mine left some peaches at my house the other day. They're outrageously good. So I think of Thich Nhat Hanh. He slows down, he says, each bite and he really savors it. And Thich Nhat Hanh has spent, uh, what is it now, six decades completely dedicated to the peace movement and to working against over-consuming and, and trying to be a steward for this earth. I think of Joanna Macy, who's the most dedicated person I know in terms of really working to heal our planet. And her capacity for joy and her humor we do not have to be grim and we do not have to suffer in order to keep motivated to be good. It's our natural goodness that will shine through. So there's a wise balancing that we're exploring here and it's very easy to get grim. I mean, the thousand serious moves we bring into spiritual life very, very easily. I've been on retreats and I've watched people take it on as the next project of, you know, I'm going to experience the jhanas, which are the collected states of, you know, of concentration, or I'm going to, you know, having these projects, spiritual projects, and getting really intense about them. And if it's grim, it just doesn't work, really. I have uh, one person I'm thinking of, I was teaching a month-long retreat at Spirit Rock and uh, one of the persons taking the retreat got very focused and quiet, yet he realized that he had gotten too, um, too grim. So he brought his penetrating attention to haiku, okay? And I want to read you something he wrote. Great Hall meditation hall. The great hall is silent. Pinto beans for lunch. And now, some lean left, some right. <laughs> Do you get it? <laughs> We're being polite, I think. <laughs> um, he subsequently called himself haiku master Jan Tin Faust, which if you know is it's very close, suspiciously close to my husband's name, Jan Tin Faust. So the first step when we recognize, yes, I'm doing the thousand series moves. And you can use it as a filter. You can just stop at any point of the day and say, am I on my way somewhere and is it tight? You know? If we're doing the thousand serious moves, the first step is intention. 
it's just having that desire to be able to be here and embrace this life like that little infant. You had to be here. You have to be here if you're going to embrace this life. To have that intention to plant seeds of gratitude, of happiness. And there's going to be three, three related ways that I'm going to explore now about planting seeds. The first one is gratitude. Uh, gratitude is incredibly powerful practice. It's a natural experience when we're present to feel grateful and you can actually practice bringing the attention to gratitude and neuroplasticity kicks in. You actually shift from complaining mind to grateful mind. It is freedom. So, research. Uh, I mentioned Marty Seligman last week, who is the, the father of positive psychology, which developed out of this same understanding. It's not enough to suffer. We have wiring for experiencing joy. Why get fixated on the negative? So what he did was he worked with some severely depressed people and he had them write three good things that happened to them for 15 days. So each day they'd write the three good things. At the end, 94% had a decrease in depression. 92% said happiness increased. He says in his trainings, the most effective thing is to pick someone you feel grateful toward, write a one-page letter, read to that person, and listen attentively to their response. Now, what you'll find in each of these ways of planting seeds there's the contemplation or reflection, but there's also this action you can do. And if you bring it into action, more parts of the brain get involved and it actually lets the positive emotion flower. So you can feel gratitude. You, I can feel this sense of, I'm really grateful that you all want to come and get together and explore these teachings that are so precious to me. So I can feel that, but saying that out loud just now, and meaning it, because I do, you know, it, just, it softens, it, it wakes us up. You might decide to have a gratitude buddy. That can be really beautiful, which is where you just have one person and you send an email each day. You don't have to say hi, you don't have to have a sign off. All you do is list a few things you're grateful for. It's a training. And it's a training that can profoundly change your mood. It's a trick also when life is really difficult. How do you frame things in a way that allows you, it's not to be Pollyanna-ish, but just to see a bigger picture, to shift things around some. You might remember the story about Saul and Mort. They're, they're walking from religious services and Saul's wondering if it's okay to smoke while praying. So Mort says, why don't you ask the rabbi? So he goes up to the rabbi and says, Rabbi, may I smoke while I pray? And the rabbi says, no, my son, you may not. That's disrespect to our religion. Goes back, tells his friend what the rabbi said and Mort says, I'm not surprised. You asked the wrong question, let me try. So he goes to the rabbi and says, Rabbi, is it all right if I pray while I smoke? <laughs> by all means, my son, by all means. <laughs> so it, it's a practice. There's many people that, um, and you might sense as I know in myself, how much complaining goes on in my mind. So it gets really interesting and I'll, I'll share one favorite story. Uh, this is uh, James Barres, and I think we still have his book here. We, we sell it regularly. It's called Awakening Joy, and it's really good. He's got a lot of good practices in it. And uh, James tells a story. Uh, James is a, a really good buddy, and I've been hearing stories about his mom for years and years, but this most recent one is great. He spent some time with her when she was 89. He went down to L.A. to visit her. She is a self-proclaimed half-full type, okay? okay? Real feisty woman, wonderful woman. So he's sharing with her about the benefits of gratitude and she's kind of skeptical, like, you know, I'm an old dog, you know, you know it's like I've been half-full for a lot of decades. 
So he turned it into a game, and the game was every time she made a complaint, then she was going to be adding, and my life is very blessed. You know, so the TV is broken, and my life is very blessed, you know. Okay, they forgot to deliver the newspaper today, and my life is very blessed, and so on and so on. He was there for a week and, for the, and he was able to support her and it actually turned fun. I mean, they had a good time with it. And then he'd call her, you know, over the next few weeks and he said, miraculously, it stopped. And he said, there was a real revolutionary change in her mood and her attitude. This is his 89-year-old mother. Now, during this time, these last few months that, you know, he was kind of supporting her in it, she was losing her eyesight which is a really big deal. So I want to read you what she sent him on her 90th birthday. They have a family kind of uh, tradition of sending poems. She says, I'm happier than I've ever been and truly mean each word. The thoughts that cause the worries now all seem so absurd. Though my eyesight has been dimmed, I see clearer than before. The glass is not half empty. It's overflowing, to be sure. So, I, I wanted to share that because it's, this is a practice that if you take on, um, you can do it at any time during the day. I, I sometimes, when I first start sitting, if I'm feeling like I'm in a certain mood, will just take some moments to just reflect on everything that's good in my life, everything I feel blessed for. So let's just take a moment together now. We'll just get a taste and then we'll move on to the next type of seed we're planting.